Amongst its monsters, Universal has villains, victims, and tragic heroes. But James Wales, the Invisible Man, is something else. An anti-hero. He meddled in things men should leave alone. He is a violent psychopath. All a hoax! All a hoax! But he is the character we follow, and we almost want to see him succeed. More than that, unlike any other classic monster, we want to be the Invisible Man. Wouldn't everyone like to be invisible for a day? The development of Universal's adaptation of H.G. Wells' The Invisible Man could fill a video in itself. Four directors were attached before the job went to James Whale, and multiple scripts were written by 13 writers, including John Huston and Preston Sturgis. A lot of these early versions were based more on Philip Wiley's 1931 book The Murderer Invisible, featuring an invisible octopus and hordes of invisible rats spreading bubonic plague. Ideally, Universal wanted the prestige of Wells' name and the melodrama of Wiley's plot, but since Wells had script approval, it's hard to see why they bothered. Whale himself wrote a treatment when he took over, and then contacted a writer whom he knew and trusted. R.C. Sheriff was, in some ways, the man to whom Whale owed his career. His stage play, Journey's End, based on his own First World War experiences, made Whale's name as a theatre director and that of his leading man, Colin Clive. Both men came to Hollywood to make the film version, and a year later would write their names into horror history as director and star of Frankenstein. In the name of God, now I know what it feels like to be God. When Whale hired him to write the screenplay for The Invisible Man, Sheriff's first act was to reread Wells' book, and he would later express surprise that previous writers had moved away from it. Though he would make some necessary changes in the adaptation, Sheriff stayed close to the original text, and Wells signed off on his version though he would always consider the film shallow in comparison to his satirical novel. Casting was almost as problematic. Universal wanted Boris Karloff, their biggest horror star in the wake of Frankenstein and the Mummy, but didn't want him enough to fulfil their contractual obligations to the actor, so Karloff walked. Colin Clive's distinctive voice and theatrical delivery would have been perfect, and the actor was tempted, but preferred to spend some time back home in England. In the end, Whale went with another dramatically voiced stage performer, based on what the actor himself would later describe as the worst screen test in the history of movie making. Like Clive, Claude Rains was a theatre actor, and his test for George Cukor's Bill of Divorcement was uncinematically melodramatic, but it demonstrated his voice. And that was all Whale wanted. I want a room and a fire. That voice had been through much already. Reigns had had speech therapy to lose his cockney accent, stutter and inability to pronounce his R's. A gas attack during the First World War, as well as leaving the actor practically blind in one eye, had damaged his vocal cords, giving his voice a husky rasp. But to Whale, all this was an asset. There's a way back, you fool. There must be a way back. He wanted a voice that stood out, a voice with character, a voice that had all the expression of a face because the face would not be seen until the film's final shot. Reigns grasped the opportunity, and his voice has more stage presence than most actors can manage with their whole body. You're crazy to know who I am, aren't you? All very well, but all for nothing if the big question could not be answered. Is this possible? MGM had already rejected the project because they did not believe that the Invisible Man could be convincingly realised, and in his script, Sheriff had assumed that scenes like this <laughs> would be achieved using a wire frame operated like a marionette. Enter John P. Fulton, head of Universal's effects department, who said it could be done using multiple printing with travelling mats. From our first glimpse, to this stunning revelation. <laughs> Look, he's all eaten away. 
Fulton created effects that would astonish audiences of the time and which continue to impress today. Uh, how do you like that, eh? He would eventually garner three Oscar nominations for his work on the franchise. We'll come to the how later, but most important was that Fulton's effects, with the help of clever wire work from Al Johnson and Bob Laszlo, allowed the Invisible Man to be played by an actor as a character. Whale never wanted the audience to just be hearing the voice, so he gave his character things to do, making it difficult for himself, but bringing the character to life and giving a visual presence to Rain's disembodied voice. Oh, it's no good talking like this. Conversely, Rain's' voice makes the effects more than a gimmick, the actor's performance coming together with the groundbreaking effects to create one of the most memorable characters in the universal canon. <laughs> Unlike most Universal monsters, the Invisible Man is the lead, dominating the action. Appearing out of the snow, as he does in Wells' book, he is at first a mystery. We see his frustration. There must be a way back. God knows there's a way back. And his temper. But he is also funny. How's that for a hairbrush, George Henry? And, like so many Universal monsters, tragic. Everything would have come right if you'd only left me alone. Scientist Jack Griffin has used a dangerous chemical. Monocaine's a terrible drug. Unaware of the side effects. Yes, and it also sent it raving mad. He is vicious. <laughs> and his plans are maniacal. We'll begin with a reign of terror. A few murders here and there. He achieves a body count of 122, far higher than any other Universal monster. I killed a stupid little policeman, smashed his head in. But listen to the change in him when he hears that his fiancée has arrived. Laura. Why, yes, of course. He sounds genuinely surprised that he forgot about her, perhaps realising for the first time that something is wrong with him. How could I forget? When he speaks to her, his manner changes. That funny little head. I always liked. Until the monocane starts to reassert itself. I shall offer my secret to the world with all its terrible power. The nations of the world will bid for it, thousands, millions. The nation that wins my secret can sweep the world with invisible armies. Crucially, Reigns did not just deliver on the melodramatic villain. Even the moon's frightened of me, frightened to death. He makes us feel for this character and understand that there is a man beneath the bandages. I was so pitifully poor. I had nothing to offer you, Flora. Which does not stop him from being an insidious and horrifying villain. Oh, I'm afraid there's going to be a nasty accident in a minute. A very nasty accident. As we've already seen, the Invisible Man's presence is usually announced by footprints, a lit cigarette or some other piece of business. Thank you, Kemp, for opening the window. This is the first of only two times in the whole film when the voice comes out of nowhere and the Invisible Man is truly unseen. Both instances are related to the murder of antagonist Kemp. I think this will do nicely, Kemp. And because these are the only times, it is like icy fingers being drawn down your spine. I went into the police station with you, Kemp. I stood by while you changed into that coat. Beyond the technical and artistic, Whale was a master of horror storytelling. You'll run gently down and through the railings, hit a boulder. Then you'll do a somersault and probably break your arms. Then a grand finish up with a broken neck. Rain's performance was an early indicator of a great career to come, but he is well supported. We're so strange those last few days before he went. So excited and strung up. Gloria Stewart appeared in three films for James Whale and would enjoy a late career resurgence after playing Old Rose in James Cameron's Titanic. It was the most erotic moment of my life. And Henry Travers, Jack Griffin's The Invisible Man, who plays Flora's father, would become iconic as Clarence the Angel in Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. AS2, what, what, what's that? AS2. Angel, second class. <laughs> The cast was packed with British stage talent imported by Whale to play locals based on the director's childhood in Dudley. Most notably, Una O'Connor, <coughs> whose eccentric performance Whale encouraged and to whom the director would leave a bequest in his will. In amongst the ensemble are some blink-and-you'll-miss-them roles by recognisable faces. 
Walter Brennan. It was pulled clean out of me hands. John Carradine. Is that the police? And Frankenstein and Dracula actor Dwight Fry, almost unrecognizable in a straight role. Can you tell us what plans you've got for capturing him? But for all these stellar contributors, the Invisible Man is very much James Whale's film. He's my nose. 1935's The Bride of Frankenstein is generally and deservedly regarded as his greatest achievement, and The Invisible Man has a similar blend of wicked humour and genuine horror presented with technical brilliance. But what might give this film the edge, all these elements are centred on the lead character. There's a souvenir for you! We've already seen that this is a funny film. He's invisible. This was the matter with him. But what really makes us follow Jack Griffin as this terrible yet compelling anti-hero is not so much that he is funny, but that he's having fun. Good morning, grandfather. How do you do? Much of what he does is nothing to do with his plans for world domination. He's simply enjoying himself. It's hard not to think that some of this is what the mischievous whale might have done himself if he had been invisible. Here we go gathering nuts and may, nuts and may, nuts and may. And it pushes the audience to ask themselves, what would I do? Whoops! The Invisible Man is a rare beast, a wish fulfillment horror. At the time of recording, invisibility remains impossible, but how was it achieved in the film? The wire work is well executed, but no mystery. This will give them something to write home about. This sort of thing, however, requires some explanation, albeit a greatly simplified one. Scenes were shot without the Invisible Man. He was added later. An actor, either Reigns himself or a stand-in, was dressed in black velvet with the character's clothes on top, so tightly bound up that he was working deaf and blind and breathing through a tube inserted up the leg of the black suit. Taking a cue from theatrical black art, the actor would then be filmed in front of a black velvet background, a technique Jim Henson would use over 50 years later in his movie Labyrinth and this image was then added to the previously shot scene using an optical printer, combining the images. It's the forerunner of modern green screen and all sounds simple, but the lighting had to be matched to what had already been shot. Each shot was executed more than 20 times to be sure they got what they needed, and if the actor's blacked out hand passed in front of his body, then the take was ruined. And consider this scene. Because we can see the Invisible Man's front and back, plus the walls in front of him and behind him in the mirror, this single image combines four different pieces of film. And even with all the care taken, close to 64,000 individual frames had to be retouched by hand. For Universal to want to do this again, it had to be worthwhile. The Invisible Man was Universal's most successful film since Frankenstein, but it had to wait until 1940 for a sequel. In the late 30s, under new management and struggling financially, Universal started to reboot and shoot belated sequels to its horror properties. Unlike some of these films, The Invisible Man Returns was given a healthy budget, allowing Fulton to recreate his remarkable effects, and even to go further. In shots like this, from the original, Griffin's head is a wire frame, because otherwise you would not be able to see the bandages on the inside. But now, Fulton actually matted the eye holes so we can see within the head of our new Invisible Man. And that new Invisible Man was another inspired piece of casting. But if the worst comes to the worst, I can always get a job haunting a house. His voice would acquire its more recognisable timber with age, but even here, in his first horror film, Vincent Price's mellifluous tones are distinctive enough to make him an ideal successor to Reigns. You're not mistaking my good spirits for madness, I hope. Though he is playing a very different character in a very different story. Just two more hours and they're going to kill him. Price's Jeffrey Radcliffe is in a prison cell awaiting the death penalty for a murder he did not commit. But on the eve of his execution... He's gone! This follows a visit from his friend, scientist Frank Griffin. I've been looking up the file on your late brother. That was nine years ago, wasn't it? So this time, the Invisible Man is the hero, trying to prove his innocence before the police catch him. Darling, I can't just sit around here with Michael's murderer at large. 
but of course it's not that simple. Standard in funeral! Director Joe May and screenwriters Lester Cole and Kurt Siebmack foreshadow the madness that comes with monocaine. He concocted the formula which included a poisonous drug called duocaine. And presumably duocaine as well, giving the script another source of jeopardy. How long do you think I have before I go mad? As Frank Griffin races to find the cure. Frank, sure you'll have the antidote within a few days. The murder plot, based around labour relations in a coal mine, is not that engaging. Perhaps it hasn't occurred to you that company doesn't pay you to stand here swapping mystery stories. And the film has the bright, characterless veneer found in most mid-period Universal horrors, lacking the atmosphere of their earlier triumphs. There are some funny moments. No, oh, he took off his clothes. No wonder she fainted. But by making The Invisible Man a hero, we lose much of the first film's twisted sense of fun. But, but I can't see you. Of course you can't. I'm a ghost. At least initially. Things start to change when Radcliffe is discovered by the police. In fact, I'm sure you'd better stay. This brilliant and totally unexpected moment is unlike any effect in the first film and is quickly followed by another. By holding these effects back, the film re-energises partway through as the trapped Radcliffe tries to escape. Though Jack Griffin was similarly surrounded by police, he never seemed under threat like this. It's a stellar sequence, and directly after, the effects of the drug start to show. Power for good, if you're so inclined, or should you feel perverse for evil? In the original, we are told Jack Griffin is a good man, made insane by the drug, but here we get to see the transition, allowing us to feel sympathy for Radcliffe, even as his actions become more violent. Yeah. Joe May, who directed silent classic Asphalt in Germany, spoke little English, though fortunately Vincent Price could act as interpreter, but the language barrier hasn't stopped him from producing an enjoyable film. You must realise that if the monster murders, the scientist hangs. While it doesn't rise to the heights of Wales original and the first half does drag, this is a solid sequel with genuine tension and superior effects work. I really shouldn't. They'll be able to catch me now. While it's true that this invisible man is more vanilla than Reigns, it's good to see the film not simply retreading old ground. The ending, for instance, consciously references the first film but goes in a different direction. That said, it's notable how much more fun, how much more engaging the film becomes when insanity takes hold and Radcliffe can be a bit more wicked. We don't want just an invisible man, we want this invisible man. The one who does the things we only dream of. Don't worry, I'll be back. <laughs> Though, of course, it doesn't have to be a man. Like the original, The Invisible Man Returns was a big financial success and Universal quickly capitalised. With a slight twist. It's a her. <laughs> you mean skirts and things? Mm. The Invisible Woman was released the same year, but has no connection to the franchise and indeed is not a horror. It's a comedy. Although much of the humour is as insubstantial as its protagonist. The story is credited to Joe May and Kurt Siebmack, so may have had some connection to the previous film, perhaps a discarded plotline. This is the only film in the franchise set predominantly in the US, and this time the offending scientist is Professor Gibbs. You all think I'm crazy. I can't understand it. Played by former matinee idol John Barrymore, his performance a knowing caricature of his brother Lionel. I am not interested. I am highly displeased. Sadly, the actor's alcoholism had taken its toll, and his lines had to be placed about the set for him to read. Help me pick the victim. You know, a peculiar fellow took my ad, thought I was cuckoo. The supporting cast also includes Stooge, Shemp Howard, and Wicked Witch of the West, Margaret Hamilton. Well, what is this, Halloween? Although shot as a B picture, the film was given twice the usual B movie budget, acknowledging that John P. Fulton's effects were the selling point. I really am 
I'm invisible. Still, some shots are less well executed than in the past. When the invisible woman's hands pass her body, her arms reappear and her shadow can be seen on the wall. But, as always, Fulton also pushed himself, and the invisible woman interacts with other characters more than her male predecessors. You know, when it rains like this, all the roads around here get washed out, so you and the professor better plan to spend the night. The title role of Invisible Woman Kitty Carroll was taken by Virginia Bruce. This is the call to adventure. And while you couldn't call the character an anti-hero, she does embody the mischievous spirit of the Invisible Man. What would you do if you could completely disappear? Independent and impulsive, the first thing she does after the experiment is run away to get revenge on her jerk of a boss. If a girl's late, you're finer. If a girl's got a cold, you're fire her. Before trashing her place of work. And there's no suggestion in this film that the serum makes you crazy. This is just a woman kicking back at the world. Which for 1940 is pretty impressive. At the end, she's the one who saves the day. I don't know my own strength. Taking out her captors single-handed. Although you still couldn't call it progressive. Sure, any girl who'd become invisible can't be very easy on the eye. And at least part of the reason this was made was the opportunity for some light titillation that the censors couldn't object to because you don't really see anything. There. It sells the idea of nudity. We'll have to get her to bed. OK, let me. Uh -oh. I forgot she's... Yeah, she certainly is. The Invisible Woman is a pretty bad film. Not funny enough to be a comedy. What did I? Something has gone wrong, I think. Not even trying to be anything else. Flying catch! Meow, meow. Sure I can fly. Here, catch him. But Invisible Man films live and die on their central character. And for all the film's faults, Kitty Carroll does capture what we love about the Invisible Man, the playfulness and wish fulfillment. Now I know what I'd do. I'd kick him right in the pants. You've always had a kick coming. And here's one for interest and one to grow on. In fact, of all the films in the franchise, this is the one that best addresses that central question. What would you do if you could become invisible? An interesting sidebar to the two Invisible Man films made in 1940. The labour relations subplot in The Invisible Man Returns and the conclusion in which the mine workers give their blood to save their decent employer Sir Jeffrey has to have a blood transfusion to save his life. Full volunteer. <laughs> are likely to have been the invention of screenwriter Lester Cole, who ten years later would go to jail during the communist witch hunts as one of the Hollywood Ten. The Invisible Woman has a similar, if less subtle, attitude to management versus labour. You were two minutes late this morning, you're docked an hour's pay. That's unfair. I've never been late before. And besides, two minutes is exactly one thirtieth of an hour. And all three of its screenwriters were members of the American Communist Party. Robert Lees and Fred Rinaldo were both blacklisted during the 1950s, while Gertrude Purcell was a friendly witness, naming names to the House Un-American Activities mm -hmm. Committee. She attempted suicide shortly afterwards and would never work in Hollywood again. It's probably a mistake to read too much into this, but it does again illustrate how well the Invisible Man works as an anti-establishment hero. But the professor said you were to stay here. Oh, not me. Ha <laughs> ha. Growly, growly, here I come. But things were about to change. The Invisible Woman was released in December 1940. One year later, Pearl Harbor was attacked. America entered the Second World War, and Hollywood was quick to turn its product to patriotic purpose, blurring the line between propaganda and entertainment in films like Alfred Hitchcock's Saboteur. Most universal horror did not lend itself to such stories, but The Invisible Man seemed tailor-made for it. Invisible Agent, the second proper sequel, came out in 1942 and starts strongly. What did he say? Oh, Oregon State plays Duke University football in the Rose Bowl. An incident of great national importance. As well as establishing the character's un-American disinterest in the Rose Bowl, this line also dated the film for contemporary viewers, placing it just before Pearl Harbor. These men are here to meet John Hall's Frank Raymond, who changed his name from Griffin when he moved to the US to put his family history behind him. All we want to buy is your father's formula, or 
Was it your uncle who discovered it? No, no, no. It was his grandfather, Frank Griffin. Jack Griffin, actually, but we'll let that pass. These spies from the Axis powers will go to any lengths to get the invisibility formula. Come, come, Mr Griffin. While there is still time... It's a tense and genuinely disturbing scene. Stop, I'll tell! ...that promises to deliver on what is a strong premise. Escaping, Raymond is recruited by his own government, his initial reluctance won over by the Japanese attack. He is now willing for his drug to be used, but with a caveat. The drug is to be used by no one but myself. This is a stupid plan, and it's made to seem more so by the immediate acquiescence of the military top brass. You a man of conviction is often more to be desired than a man of experience. Suggesting that all their training is pointless. But this does have to be viewed as propaganda, and the underlying message is that an untrained American is worth more than the German army. I am inclined to think Mr. Raymond is equal to the task. Inevitably, there are other aspects of the film which have to be considered in the context of their time. I can't tell you Jeff's apart. Well, this one is Peter Lorre, the only German actor in a film set mostly in Germany, and he's playing a Japanese baron. As the rising sun never sets, so her servants never sleep. Another issue films of this era share is the desire to make the Germans simultaneously devious. That is the common chatter of a man poisoned by the ideology of a decadent democracy. And incompetent. I don't know, but watch it! To make them dangerous adversaries. Oh, oh. Who will nevertheless be easy to beat. These problems are common in movies of the time, but Invisible Agent has issues of its own. Raymond is in Germany to discover the details of an attack on the US, making contact with double agent Maria, played by Ilona Massey, who has arranged dinner with a German commander to get the information. He's ordered an attack upon the United States. But her attempts are ruined by Raymond playing tricks on Oberst Heiser. After all, there's such a thing as carrying loyalty too far. Until the German leaves in a huff. This is an insult to the entire Nazi party. Mocking the Nazis got a big audience reaction in 1942, but he has torpedoed his mission. A whole year's work destroyed in a few minutes. These childish pranks give away his presence to Gestapo Gruppenführer Stauffer. I really don't know what happened, sir. The, the food seemed to creep up on me. Really? For the first time you interest me. Worse still... A number on Gartenstadt has just called Miss Sorensen's house. Raymond makes a phone call that gives away one of his contacts, who is then tortured. You've broken my fingers. Of course, there should be a reason for this. Are you insane? Sadly not. In this film, the drug doesn't lead to insanity. It's another concession to propaganda. An American hero can't be going mad in wartime. But it's a shame because... As well as excusing the Invisible Man's behaviour, an Allied agent going insane on a mission would have made a more interesting film, albeit a less inspiring one. Are we going to have to resort to force? Oh, I see. German logic. But even the patriotic message is weak because most of what the Invisible Man does is fix his own errors. You have messed up everything. Maria would have got the information without him. At the end, Maria saves him. And he only escapes death because the Germans and Japanese turn on each other. John P. Fulton's effects once again tread impressive new ground, not least in giving the title character a face made of cold cream. But Invisible Agent is still a weak entry in the franchise, failing even on its own terms because the hero does little that is heroic. And maybe that's the problem. The Invisible Man is not cut out for heroism. He is by nature clandestine, sneaking up on people. When he was a bad guy, the silly tricks were fun. But they seem wrong when lives are at stake. I really don't understand. <laughs> All that said, 
The burst of patriotic fervor paid off, and Invisible Agent was a very profitable film for Universal. <coughs> guaranteeing a continuation of the franchise. I'm invisible. Sort of. 1944's The Invisible Man's Revenge needs some explanation. John Hall returns in the lead role, this time named Robert Griffin, and the title implies a sequel. But this has no connection to previous films, which must have been very confusing to anyone going in cold. Tell me, Julie, did you ever know a man by the name of Griffin? Given the character's name, this may have been conceived as a direct sequel and changed at some point, but why Griffin? Any other name would have done. I don't know. She lies there babbling about invisible men and, and griffins. A somewhat confused plot also suggests rewrites, and if I had to guess, I would say that Robert Griffin changed from good guy to bad guy during the film's development. He has a legitimate grievance. We thought you were done for. Yes. And you went on without me. Abandoned during a diamond mining expedition. I made you rich, didn't I? Five years later, he has found his way home to claim his share, but his old friends now drug him I... ask me to help you. and escort him out. I'll come back, and when I do, I'll get you and... On the other hand, they didn't leave him behind on purpose. Please try to understand. We thought that you were dead. He refuses a reasonable compromise. I'll give you half of our own money, more than half. It's not enough. Oh. And he goes after his friend's daughter. Julie whom he has never actually met, but whose picture he has become obsessed with. Bet you never dreamed what became of that picture you had of her on safari. It was lost. No, it wasn't. I've got it. I've kept it always. And right at the start... <laughs> these events are only hinted at once in the rest of the film. I've already killed three men with a knife like this. So perhaps the shot was added later to better establish him as a villain. Either way, it makes him the only Griffin who is insane before he becomes invisible. I suppose you think I'm mad, don't you? Like the Invisible Woman, Robert Griffin is made invisible by a third party. An invisible man! John Carradine, upgrading from his bit part in the first movie to an eccentric scientist with a small menagerie of invisible pets. He comes to a bad end when Griffin drains his blood to become visible again, the most traditionally horror concept in the entire franchise, and one that annihilates any chance of Griffin being considered sympathetic. I'm going to stay this way as long as there's blood to be had. Once again, John P. Fulton finds some new tricks, and the difficulty of executing this invisible travelling shot cannot be underestimated. But the pressures of time and budget do tell. This knife disappears. Now give it to me. And even the traditional unwrapping scene is carelessly executed. I was causing too much excitement wandering around without any head. Possibly there was neither time nor money for the retouching of individual frames that had cleaned up discrepancies in the first film. Up you come now. The wire work too has become clumsy and obvious. But what really fails here is the invisible man as a character. Although the film has humour... Jim Feeney! He's fearless, and you can trust him. A little. And yeah, I'll watch him too. The character does not. In an inversion of Invisible Agent, Robert Griffin is a bad guy without a sense of fun. So why would we follow him as a lead character as we did Jack Griffin 11 years earlier? Uh, your blood will make me invisible, and I'll marry Julie while, while you rot in your grave. The film's heart is in the right place, a blameless victim whose quest for justice turns to vengeance after he is made invisible might have worked. The man is definitely psychopathic. But the confusion of events and motivations, to the extent that one main character disappears altogether, makes this an unsatisfying mess of a film that only serves to highlight the brilliance of what James Whale pulled off. I couldn't pass up a story about an invisible man. Why, it's better than a monster of Loch Ness. Financially, it did well, but it was certainly the right time to let the Invisible Man vanish. We've nothing more to fear from the Invisible Man. In 1948, the Universal Invisible Man returned to the screen briefly at the end of Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. There's nobody to break this anymore. Oh, that's too bad. I was hoping to get in on the excitement. 
The voice was Vincent Price's, and the success of the horror comedy mashup ensured that the Invisible Man would get his own meeting with the comic duo in 1951. Sadly, without Price. The film can be seen as a genuine sequel to the classic franchise as it directly references the original. Do you want to go insane as John Griffin did? When he willed me this formula, I swore I'd never use it until I'd found some safe reagent. But it also feels a little like a comedy remake of The Invisible Man Returns, featuring another wrongly accused man trying to prove his innocence, as well as borrowing footage and dialogue. That makes me a nemesis. It makes me a dictator. It makes me king! It makes me nemesis! Effects were handled by David S. Horsley, who had worked with Fulton on three of the last four films. In almost 20 years, only the invisible woman bothered with underwear. The special effects are the only constant in the franchise. Eye-catching and unbelievable though they must have been to contemporary audiences, their most important function was in creating a character in a franchise in which character is everything. There's a case to be made that John P. Fulton played that character as much as any actor. <laughs> Certainly his role in the franchise cannot be underestimated, achieving something that others had written off as impossible. In addition to The Invisible Man, Fulton, who was nicknamed The Doctor, worked on a large chunk of Universal's classic horror output, a handful of Hitchcock films, including Vertigo, and won Oscars for his work on The Ten Commandments and Wonder Man. In 1966, while in Spain working on the Battle of Britain, he contracted a rare infection and died, aged just 63. Despite a career spanning over 250 films, it is The Invisible Man and the groundbreaking techniques he used that are his lasting legacy. But if Fulton got there first, others were swift to follow. In 1949, the character appeared in Japanese film The Invisible Man Appears, courtesy of special effects giant Eiji Tsuburaya. Through the decades, invisible men have been seen, so to speak, in Mexico, Germany, Italy, France, India, and of course his home nation in, among others, the optimistically titled TV series H.G. Wells The Invisible Man. He's been in B-movies, 3D movies, family comedies, thrillers, and, let's be honest, quite a lot of movies with adult content. And while few of these are related to the original film or the book, they all draw on that legacy, and their central theme remains irresistible to this day, whether in Harry Potter's cloak or the boy's translucent. There is something tantalising about invisibility. That combination of wish fulfilment and the knowledge that you can't be caught. The ability to act with impunity. Power to rule, to make the world grovel at my feet. It brings out the worst in characters, but also allows us a frisson of, I wish I could do that. This is what creates the anti-hero, the evil character whom we follow despite their actions. And at their best, invisible characters walk that line. Few, if any, have walked it as adeptly as Jack Griffin, as created by H.G. Wells and R.C. Sheriff, by Claude Rains and John P. Fulton, and of course by James Whale, who put so much of himself into his outsider characters. Here we go gathering nuts and may, nuts and may, nuts and may. Here we go gathering nuts and may on a cold and frosty morning. All other adaptations walk in the long shadow of a character who doesn't cast one. Thanks for watching, and special thanks to our Patreon supporters, without whom we could not produce these longer, more detailed videos. What was your take on Universal's new reboot of The Invisible Man, directed by Lee Whannell? Let us know in the comments below, and if you'd like another take on the character, check out my book on Amazon.